From the home studios of the Teaching Systems Lab at MIT, this is Teach Lab, a podcast about the art and craft of teaching. I'm Justin Reich. Today's guest is Barry Fishman, a professor of education and information at the University of Michigan, where his research focuses on the use of technology to support teacher learning, video games as models for learning environments, and the role of education leaders in fostering classroom level reform involving technology. Barry is also the author of a new introduction to the 50th anniversary edition of What You Get, The Grading Game in American Education, a classic book on grading systems. Welcome, Barry. We're happy to have you here on Teach Lab. So happy to be with you, Justin. And I bring greetings from the authors of What You Get, the original authors of What You Get, Howard Kirschenbaum, Rod Napier, and Sid Simon, uh, who've authorized me to go around and talk about this book uh, without them. But uh, they're hopefully going to be very present in this conversation. Well, I'm certainly glad that they're present, given that the book is 50 years old. If these guys are still hanging in there, um, that's terrific. Yeah, that was a nice surprise to me too, actually. And the, I had one of the real joys of this project was getting to talk with them and have them tell me their stories and uh, and learn a lot from their experiences. So tell us a little bit about the origins of the book. Um, what, what did you learn in those conversations? How did these guys get together to write this story? And maybe just as a little bit of, of maybe maybe even before that, we should say, like, what is the book and how is it framed? So the book is called What'd You Get? The Grading Game in American Education, and it was originally published in 1971 by two professors at Temple University, education professors at Temple University, Rod Napier and Sid Simon, and one of their graduate students, Howard, or he goes by Howie Kirschenbaum. And uh, the book was uh, in part a reflection of their own experiences, both with teaching. They all had worked in various points of time as secondary school teachers and as college teachers. And uh, Sid Simon in particular was an early adherent of what he would call blanket grading. Let's take grades off the table. He was teaching at a, a, one of the, I think, CUNY campuses. And he said, let's give all this, I'm gonna give everyone a B. The students were fine with that. Grades are off the table. We can just focus on learning. Before that, he, would, he was teaching in, uh, in, I think, high school. And he used to say how it would break his heart to have to give these students a letter grade. Uh, and then get into sort of arguments with parents and with kids about grades. He said he wanted to use all the letters of the alphabet, really involved in sort of narrative grading. Lots of feedback was his goal. And when he got to Temple and uh, Howie uh, Kirschenbaum was in his class or TAing for his class, they decided to push it a little bit. And he said, well, let's give all the students A's. And uh, the administration did not like that. Uh, it uh, became a kind of clash around his contract and he was denied tenure. Talking about Sid Simon here. And in response, because he was such a beloved teacher, there arose protest. And Sid actually sent me some newspaper clippings from the Philadelphia Evening Bulletin, a newspaper I read as a kid growing up in Philadelphia, mainly for the comics. But, uh, you know, it was, it was this whole uh, public event that was going on around Sid Simon and his, his approach to grading. And as part of the faculty review of, uh, of Sid's tenure case in reaction to all of this, uh, they engaged Rod Napier, another professor at Temple, who did a systematic review of the research up to that time on grading. And uh, the conclusion was grading is highly problematic. It's highly contestable. What Sid's doing is completely reasonable. And uh, Sid was granted tenure. He actually ended up leaving Temple, going to UMass Amherst. But the experience was made uh, under uh, Howard Kirschenbaum's leadership into this book, which is written as a fictionalized uh, account of a suburban high school um, uh, called Mapleton High. And uh, it doesn't read like an academic book. It reads like a, you know, a, a novelized kind of debate within the community and the school and their characters. And there's a, a kind of a plot uh, in which they weave through all of this research. The work that Rod Napier did as part of the, the, the case at Temple actually became an appendix, an annotated appendix of research on grading. Uh, and the, the book um, presents the problematic nature of grading. It doesn't come to a conclusion per se. It doesn't tell you what you should do. It just, it problematizes the whole thing. Now, I was doing some work at Michigan um, and in some other places around thinking about how we could advance the state of the art in grading and really make it reflect more about learning and care and equity, things that I think are very important and very missing from uh, current grading practices. 
and a, a graduate a school colleague of mine, Lori D'Amico, uh, who had done her dissertation on what she called um, assessment infrastructures, said, oh, there's a book I read when I was doing my dissertation. This is back in like 1995. Um, at that point, it was already an old book, um, but it really made an impression on me. It's called What'd You Get? I got it out of our university library, it was in kind of deep cold storage, um, dusted it off, read it, and was just astounded to find that the ideas, the challenges, the solutions, the arguments, they were pretty much exactly the same arguments, challenges, solutions we were still having and conducting today. And I was so impressed that I did a thing, I I just don't do this. I wrote a fan letter to the authors. I found their emails online. Uh, one of them was, uh, Howard was just recently retired from, um, I think it was uh, the University of Rochester. And he's emeritus professor at I was kind of surprised that he responded to say, oh, we were so happy to get your message. Um, and because in the email, I told him why I was so inspired by the book and some of the work I was doing. He said, you know, uh, Rod and Sid and I have been kicking around the idea of trying to republish what you get somehow. We would love to see if you could help us with that. And maybe you could write a new introduction to contextualize it and kind of bring things up to date. And that was really the birth of this project. And it's really such a pleasure for me to be able to bring this book back into the the forefront of the conversation, because after its republication, what's happened is a lot of people have come out of the woodwork and said, this book made a huge impression on me when I was a pre-service teacher or when I was a teacher or a parent thinking about these things. And one of the nice things we were able to do in the republication was make it digital. That was actually one of the hardest parts of this process. There was, there were no, nothing except hard copies of this book. There was uh -huh. no digital version of it. So we somebody had to had kind to of retype it. That. Yeah, someone had to retype it. And we had to correct that and we had to up fix things. Um, uh, we were also able to make it available in accessible formats. And, uh, and the authors were willing to make it available under a Creative Commons license, which means that you could, of course, go buy a paperback version of it. But you can also deal with the electronic versions for free, which I'm really hopeful means we can put it in more people's hands, use it to catalyze more conversations, uh, and and help make you know re-energize this movement, which has got a lot of energy right now, in part because of COVID and for other reasons around grading. Well, we definitely want to get into the sort of recent COVID angle, but of course, it's also really interesting to hear that here's this thing that was written 50 years ago based on research from that time that you think still feels durable and relevant. So I don't know, can you summarize for us what are what are a couple of the key points of the grading research that Rod Napier came up with when he was defending his colleagues' uh, tenure review? What are what are what are some of the sort of key principles that that somebody might want to have in mind as they're as they're starting to read this book or think about these issues. Let me take that question really as sort of what's a rundown of the problems with grading because that's really what came out in that review and and I think yeah. you know from that literature review conducted 50 years ago uh, there's been more recent research it kind of reinforces that work and extends it in some way but first problem grades are not reliable and they're not objective. If you uh, take, um, I mean, and what's interesting is this is true for English. You might expect it like in literature, right? So teachers might be very subjective when they're grading an essay, but it's also true in math. I mean, it's true in all kinds of areas you wouldn't expect um, objectivity to be a problem. Um, that when you look at students who are judged by some third party be doing equivalent work, they might receive very different grades from their teachers. And this is in part because grades are a very confused construct. Uh, there's a term that gets used called hodgepodge grading. You know, grades include both your academic performance and your attendance. Sometimes there's a like a classroom participation element rolled in there. Who knows what that is comprised of? You know, that that might have a lot to do with whether the teacher likes you or 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 the way you look or who knows, right? I mean, all kinds of really problematic elements in that. Uh, grades remove information from the system. So uh, rather than me know what a learner has learned, I know that they have an A or a B or a C. What does that mean? Doesn't mean really anything at all, um, especially if it's a B, right? Or a C, it's like, so if I'm teaching, say, an advanced level class and I've got, and, I, and people don't do this, but if they were, if they cared to look at their students' prior performance on a transcript, they would not know what they know and don't know. They would just know what this letter thing was. And maybe you throw a curve in, that's even worse. Curves really remove information from the system and they ration success, right? So they're sort of, 
it, this is one of the worst problems with grading, I think, is that they were really designed for uh, ranking um, and sorting. They were never designed to encourage learning. And that really shows through in some of these deficiencies with what grades do. Uh, I'll go on. Grades reduce motivation for learning. There's a decades of research in academic motivation about how when there's a grade attached, people become very focused on the grade and not focused on the learning. And uh, when there's feedback uh, and a grade, people focus on the grade and they ignore the feedback. I mean, this is certainly my experience as a teacher as well. Grades contribute to student stress and mental health challenges. Uh, there was just some research published in the last couple of days uh, indicating that in very academically competitive schools, students are way more stressed than in other schools. Um, that's a lot about this sort of sorting and ranking problem. Um, and then there's issues. These are issues that weren't really highlighted in what you get. In some ways, what you get is also a product of its time. Uh, in the 70s, there was a lot of unrest of a lot of different kinds in the US. Um, but the book itself doesn't really deal with uh, sort of racial inequality uh, directly. It wasn't one of the topics that these gentlemen were focused on. Um, but more recently, we've really come to understand that when you have systems that are built around ranking and sorting, um, the places people start matter a lot. Um, and it's very hard to recover when you start from behind. Uh, and so uh, grades are one element of systemic racism and inequality in education. They, they contribute to the problem. They, they promote, they, they don't do anything to take away from that challenge. And it's one of the things that we deal with all the time when we look at issues like access to higher education, for instance, or access to jobs and the role that grades can play in that uh, can be very corrosive without, again, us really having any real information about what the learners know and can do because of what the grade is. So there's 50 years of work that's fairly durable. It sounds like there's a, there's some slice of that work that really focuses on issues of racial inequalities and other kinds of inequalities that are more new. But a kind of neat thing about reading what you get um, is you're transported back to the 1970s where people are having debates that sound pretty salient now. Um, you know, we've, we've lived through 15 months of pandemic now, um, where in lots of institutions, um, grading practices that had been very consistent in many places changed very quickly. And then in also many places changed back very quickly. You know, at my institution of MIT, um, one of the things that we discovered is that our forebearers had like buried somewhere in the books that like, you know, the like in an emergency, the chair of the faculty is allowed to change the grading system to, you know, pass no record or AB no record, something like that. Um, you know, and everyone looked around and went, aha, I'm very glad someone thought of this before. This is going to work much better than what we had planned. Um, it's also the case that in a lot of KTEL schools, you know, we did a bunch of research on this in March, April, May of 2020. Um, lots of systems went to um, uh, pass fail, went to, you know, pass no record, some kind of non grading system. Um, and uh, we interviewed teachers and, and they described to us a kind of double falling off. Um, so right when the pandemic hit, they lost a bunch of students. Then a new set of policies came in getting rid of grading systems. And then they lost a second group of students. Um, so then we were really surprised in August and September, you know, some of our sort of, you know, kind of uh, strong progressive allies with the great progressive pedagogy credentials um, were saying, we've really got to bring back some of these extrinsic motivation systems this September um, because we don't have in place what we need to, to do without them. Um, so yeah, lots of tumult about grading and grading systems over the last year. How do you, how do you see that kind of um, affecting the conversations that you're having now with folks about the book? Yeah, before I directly answer that, and by the way, thanks to you and your colleagues for all that great work uh, when the lockdowns were starting and there was a lot of rapid transition in schools. Many people commented, you know, we've never seen so much fast transition in education in the history of education, and it's a lot to deal with. And I think the work you did really helped help give people some data to work with, right, and some some ground rules to think with. I know I passed around your review of what different states were doing to a number of colleagues uh, in K-12 education in particular. Thanks, um, and in fact, we uh, at the University of Michigan held up your uh, 
that what MIT was doing as part of our debate about what we should do right now. It was very, very useful. Um, so for me, so I've been teaching at Michigan now for coming up on 25 years, and I've observed changes in my students. And I, I often characterize the change as um, a reluctance to, ex to a reluctance to exert autonomy. Um, so 25 years ago, I could um, assign my students a very loose sort of paper topic as a midterm or a final. You know, I'd like you to write a paper on a, a topic of interest to you that's related to this course um, and to you know explore some. And I have some more parameters, but very loose. Over the years, they've required more and more specificity in exactly what they should do. At some point, I introduced a rubric, which I'm dying to get rid of because. Uh, it really leads to extremely boring work when people are just responding to the rubric. The questions go from, you know, how many pages is that? To, you know, is that double space or single space? What's the, I mean, seriously, I, they want me to specify everything because our most successful learners, I'm making air quotes here, are the students who are best at following and executing instructions. That's what it means to be a successful student today and to excel. You've basically, done everything that you're told to do really, really well. Um, and um, that has led to uh, the current generation of undergraduates that are just ill-prepared to deal with um, ambiguity, which is uh, unfortunately exactly what the world presents us with, is nothing but ambiguity. Uh, and in the pandemic, we also faced a lot of ambiguity, right? What's going on? What, what should I pay attention to? How do I stay engaged? Um, and as you said, a lot of schools, uh, mine included, um, and I spoke to a lot of consortia of K-12 schools as well, moved to either pass fail or pass no record. Uh, and for listeners, no record, that just means that if you fail the class, it kind of magically disappears from the books. You weren't ever there. Um, and I think the goal there was really to focus on a th something I mentioned earlier in the conversation, uh, care, right? So great. I think grading should be about learning first. It should be about equity and it should be about care for learners. Um, and the, the, the care part was really emphasized in the pandemic um, by trying to reduce student anxiety. And I heard from, uh, from lots of different places, three different kinds of objections to that move. Uh, the first objection was we are lowering our standards. The second objection was students are gonna be unmotivated. That's the one you were just pointing at. And the third was it's not fair. It's not fair to the students who've been working hard for A's, and it's not fair to the students that are counting on the hard work they might've been doing this semester to raise their GPAs. Uh, okay, so shall we unpack those one at a time? Lead us through, Barry. All right, so the people who complain that by doing away with grades and by going to a pass-fail system, we're lowering our standards, my, my response to that is, well, what are our standards in the first place? Are we, why would we be comfortable with a student passing a course who has not gotten a handle on the core learning goals of that course. So we should be setting the idea that we're ready to, to claim that we can take credit for this course, and credit's a whole other thing, credit hours are a whole other thing, but we'll, maybe we'll get to that, but we won't. Um, if a student doesn't understand the key ideas of the class is a farce. And we should be redesigning our assessment systems to say that whatever the passing grade is, that should be acceptable level work. And people might excel beyond that, but that should be the bar. Uh, and if we're unhappy with that, then we have a problem with how we define our standards to begin with. Uh, the second thing, students are gonna be unmotivated. That's clearly one of the biggest things that came out here. But to me, that really reveals the devil's bargain in all this. You know, if students are motivated only by the grade and not by the material or their own goals um, or any number of other things that are more directly related to them as growing, developing humans, then again, we've done something terribly wrong. Now, I'm, I admit, it is very hard to make a change midstream, right? There's why they have that saying, right? You don't change horses midstream. Um, and students are really deeply enculturated into this system. So when I complained about kids today, uh, a few minutes ago, well, kids today are the product of the system we designed. And they're responding to the system extremely well. In other words, we ended up exactly where we should have. It's unfortunately the wrong place, right? Because we were pointing in the wrong direction. 
It's and, quite hard yeah. to ask teachers. It's the middle of the pandemic. We're getting rid of grades, and therefore you're ne- going to need to like generate all of these other structures for intrinsic motivation. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's one of the things that to me kind of characterized the pandemic, especially the early phase of the uncertainty and ambiguity. There is like, oh, we can do all of these things differently. Um, you know, we have we have that capacity to do so, um, but it's hard to it's hard you know it's hard to make a big change. You know, it's hard to get rid of grading. That might work, but only if we were able to change sort of you know twelve other things at the same time. Um, yeah, yeah, and we didn't equip anyone to think about that, and we didn't really give them time to to think about that. And we really were just saying, just pass the kids, right, or who you think are trying. Yeah. So it, all of that was kind of poorly aligned for actually making a difference here. The good thing though about the about these rapid changes was that it's opened the door to the conversation. Yep. Because I've never had more of my colleagues willing to talk about the purpose behind grades as I've had in the last has it been a decade now? How long has this pandemic been going on? Yeah, right. <laughs> I was going to see a year and I realized oh it's more than a year, but it's I have no idea how long anymore. Um you know, the third group that I mentioned, right, that it's unfair to the hard workers. Um you know, they're not really affected anyway. They're fine, right? They're, they're going to be okay. And the students who are trying to improve their GPAs, again, they're okay. There are other ways to support them, right? There are other ways to make it clear that they were actually improving. That's part of the problem too, is right? A lot of what we have in our grading systems and cumulative GPAs and all that, those are measures of of a moment, right? They, they represent you know, the GPA especially, we've looked at GPA variation at Michigan, for instance, and found that most of the variation in a graduating student's GPA can be explained by their experiences in their first year, maybe even in their first semester. And what's really going on there is they were adjusting to college, right? To being away from home, to all kinds of, suddenly everyone around you is as good as you were in high school, you, when you may be used to being a standout. All kinds of things are different. You're homesick. Who knows? You're rushing a sorority or fraternity. A student who tanks their fall semester, their fall freshman semester, and then goes on to distinguished work, having yeah. really balanced themselves, you know, might have a 3.7 GPA and is functionally no different from right. the, the student who, you know, successfully completed eight semesters and got a 3.9 GPA or something like that. Like, you know, when you're trying to evaluate, you know, the the the, the capacity of a person to contribute to you know to work or civil society or something like that there's no difference between those two kids exactly. except except maybe the kid who had the hard time is probably like actually better prepared for facing adversity adversity than the, the yeah. student who didn't face that you came from a, a, a an under-resourced high school and you found a way to figure it out and to make it all work you know this is the kid i'm really interested in yeah. in many ways um so those are the objections that people have and i think they really just kind of give the lie to the system uh, and they invite the question, well, what should we do, right? What could we do that's better? And I, I just, that, that's a long list of things we could do that are better. And some of those are in what you get. Um, you know, I think, I think the book doesn't conclude with that. Um, but, you know, what are, what, are the, what are the general directions that the authors kind of encourage communities to think towards? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, there's some of them are, are the ones that do get used frequently today to, to supplement or complement. Uh, standard letter-based grading systems, but written evaluations, uh, even self-evaluation sometimes. Um, the book mentions one thing that I've never fully processed and understood, but like we could have grades, but just not tell them to the students. I'm a little unclear what the point of that one is, so I don't dwell on it, neither does the book. There's um, blanket grading, which I mentioned Sid Simon had used. So I'm just going to give you all this grade. Uh, contract grading is is a more popular version today where you make a deal with the students. You say, well, here are the bundles of work that I expect you to do at a certain quality level. If you do those bundles of work, then uh, that this bundle is worth a B, this bundle is worth an A. You, you make an agreement up front, like what you're going to do. Uh, a variant on that is you actually have the student work with you to define the work they want to do and what they think that should be worth at the end. Um, we already, we've talked about pass fail or, or credit, no credit. Um, and then a lot of these lead up to, to me, what I think is the sort of the, the real goal here, which is, and the, the language here is, is, um, contestable, but in the book, they call it mastery based grading. It's still called mastery based grading, um, or mastery learning other terms that get thrown around that are equivalent or competency based, uh, grading or competency based assessment. 
a new term I heard recently, uh, Randy Bass at Georgetown was using this language, and I like it a lot, talking about accomplishment-based or capability-based uh, grading, right? A real record of what a learner knows and can do. Uh, and that's important because it lets us start to distinguish what people know and therefore what it is they need to focus on next. That's what's missing from current grading systems, which tend to sort of smooth all those differences out uh, and make it very hard to distinguish between learners and to figure out what they need or where they're headed or how to how to customize or tailor their their program. I mean, all kinds of things start to open up when you actually have a record of what somebody knows how to do and what they have done. And there are some domains that have had some success moving in those kinds of competency and mastery directions. Um, you know, especially places where high quality work is well defined. Um, you know, I, I was involved in some efforts to bring competency based, accomplishment based sorts of evaluations into teacher education. And we were often comparing ourselves to medical education. You know, and there's certain things in medical education, like a paramedic, you know, comes up to someone who's not breathing on the street and they try to intubate them. And you can tell pretty readily whether or not the intubation worked. Like, their, their chest is moving up and down and air is passing back and forth or it's not um, in teacher education. Some of these things are much more ambiguous. You know, um, how well did a student, um, you know, create a classroom environment that was inclusive to all? Um, how how much did they challenge students to the degree you know, that sort of put them in their zone of proximal development, had them feel um, challenged and stretched, but not overwhelmed? Um, some of those things are are sort of more subjective, you know, maybe maybe as subjective as ABC or 87, 93, uh, 97 are. Um, but uh, how much do you think the kind of practical challenges of alternative grading systems are what bog people down versus, you know, inertia or moral objection or other kinds of things like that? I, the practical challenges are real. Um... And they, but they're to 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 say that's why we're not going to try this is um, is to accept something that we know is inadequate, right? Because you could say, oh, it's so much harder to judge whether someone's uh, sort of executing these uh, these sort of key um, signature moves in education well. But what's better, the praxis exam? You know, certainly the not practice practice exam, which is the test that teachers take to become teacher, and it's like a um, right. Uh, is there some per performance component to it or it's mostly a multiple choice test? It varies from place to place, from state to state, as such things do in yep. education. But, you know, let's talk about other domains. Right. So I, I think in, uh, you know, I'll pick on the sciences. Uh, so especially in college, where a lot of introductory science classes tend to be quite large, uh, we we have adopted the multiple choice exam. Uh, sometimes there's a short answer. Sometimes there's like a show me your work kinds of things. Uh, but by and large, we have these exams and decades of sort of question banks that have been developed in your physics department or your chemistry department. And those are, um, you know, those are now accepted as what it means to be a successful learner in those intro science classes. But I don't know a scientist who would believe that responding to those exam questions is what it means to be a scientist or to do science or understand science. Um, it's a compromise that we've made. And then what happens is, and this is, I think, true of grading in general, you know, it's been around for about 100 plus years now in one form or another. Uh, but because we built systems and infrastructures, that's a term that I, I like using a lot, uh, around these systems um, that start to reinforce the practices that we have, we suddenly start to view these things as not just normal, but natural, right? And don't don't stop to ask, what else could we do? So whenever somebody gives me the argument that it's too much work to do this better thing, um, you know, to me, that's you're, you're making a really false choice, right? Why are we, why don't we find a way to, re if we're doing a, a not great thing right now, why don't we find a way to try to reduce the scope of what we're attempting in order to do something smaller, better? Right, that would be to me the, the the wiser approach than to just keep trying to do everything, everything, everything poorly, which is I think what we currently accept as as the curriculum in K twelve and college education. 
Now, Barry, you have not only sort of argued about these ideas, but you've bu done a bunch of design and innovation and technology development in your own classes with partners and things like that. Um, if we signed up for your courses at the University of Michigan, what would what would grading and evaluation look like? And what are some things that you're trying out and playing with either in your own classes or with colleagues or? And I should say, it, it's actually, I'm happy to say that after a decade of doing this work, it's not just my courses, but we've got, I think we last year did some calculation and realized that a quarter of the graduating seniors had had an experience in a course using the tools and systems that we've designed at Michigan. And we've got, we're up to something like um, 200 instructors now and tens of thousands of students. And it's also spread across about a hundred institutions, but usually one person at each of those institutions, not not like a movement like on our campus, but we call this gameful learning. And it's it's really rooted in assessment systems. And it's um, it's inspired by all of the abundant research on games and learning, uh, many of much of which comes out of your institution, Eric Klopfer, uh, Mitch Resnick, you've been involved in this work over the years and in lots of different ways. Um, there's a definition. So I was inspired by uh, originally work by people like Jim G. Um, who argues in his book, it was, came out around 2003, uh, a book called What Video Games Have to Teach Us About Learning and Literacy. He argues that any successful commercial video game is also a successful learning environment because a really well-designed game does some things that uh, are necessary for it to become successful. First, it has to get you engaged and it has to keep you engaged even through extreme challenges and struggles. Uh, a really well-designed game does this through lots of ways, but in part it appeals to your curiosity. Uh, it encourages you to take risks because you understand that, you know, the consequences of failure are not like, now you don't get to go to the college you want, uh, which is what the way the school game is designed, but you know, you'll go back to the beginning of this level and try again, right? Or back to the beginning of the game and try again. It's, it's the, the risks of failure are reduced in order to encourage what we might call productive failure, which by the way, is really failure driven learning is very powerful. Right. There's nothing like, in fact, uh, I think it's um, John Dewey um, who said uh, that um, failure is instructive and a true thinking person learns as much from his failures from his successes. Um, and that's embodied in, in well-designed games. Uh, and uh, I mentioned Eric Klopfer at the Education Arcade at MIT. He, he said a thing once that I just loved. He said, you know, um, people play a well-designed game because it's hard not despite the fact that it's hard, people seek out challenge in games. Now, as an educator and as a program director for undergraduate programs at one point in my school, I, I can't think of the last time a student came to me and said, what's the hardest thing I can do next? That's just not how the education game is played. The education education is a game. It, it meets all the definitions of a game, of any game definition you care to find. Uh, my favorite comes from Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman, who are famous game designers. Uh, Katie's gotten more into education recently. She does some things with Minecraft for education and, uh, and so forth, connected camps with uh, Mimi Ito, uh, whose work I think you know well. Um, you know, that definition says uh, a game is a system in which players engage in an artificial conflict defined by rules that results in a quantifiable outcome. <laughs> that's a, that, that's an awful lot like school. It's a perfect definition of school. So my takeaway from that is, look, school is a game. It's just a terrible game. And what we need to do is figure out why it's such a terrible game and follow some of the rules that scholars like Jim G and other people have given us to make it into a better game. And to me, a lot of that comes back to the assessment system. Uh, so for instance, in my classes, uh, rather than have a, so the percentage-based grading system, which is the norm, that's the system that the what you get folks are really pushing back against. Um, everybody starts with 100. And then it's yours to lose. So let's say you do pretty well, Justin, on the midterm, you got a 95. Good work. Not 100 anymore. Yep. You're playing a losing game. And I can't tell you how every year around midterms, I, I look on Reddit for the University of Michigan subreddit. And there's always posts of people saying things like, I got a 34% on the, the CS1 midterm. You know, Am I doomed? And people come back and say, no, that's actually a pretty good score. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? Uh, and at the end of the semester, people say things like, I only need to get 150% on this final to pass this course. It's like, well, that's not going to happen. So that student, not being a fool, will stop paying attention to that course, right? Put their energy where it might matter. 
So in my classes, you start at zero. Welcome to class. You all have nothing, but you can end up wherever you choose. And then I map out lots of pathways that people can get there. And I have a lot of different kinds of assignments for people to do all aligned with my learning goals. The objective of which is that by the end of the class, you will have done enough work in enough areas to demonstrate to me that you have met those learning goals, but everyone will have taken a slightly different path to get there. I mean, it's not like everyone's totally individualized. There's variance, but there's, uh, you know, in the end, what I'm trying to do is give the learner some autonomy, some choice and some freedom to have productive failure. Because when somebody, it, when they get their first big paper back from me and they have only earned half of the available uh, points on that paper, say, or they haven't met, they've only met half of the learning goals, their first response is to freak out. This has never happened to me at Michigan. But then we sit down and we've built tools and infrastructure uh, and a tool called Gradecraft that helps them map their way to the goals they do have for success. And that, that has proven to be a very popular system with students because it, it gives them control back. And it's proven a very popular system with instructors because it allows them to grade very, to like say, I mean, to be very firm, right? With what they're demanding of students and to have very high expectations and, and help students find their way to them. So that's, it's not, um, it's not all the way to mastery based grading yet, but it's on, it's on the pathway to that, depending on how you use it. And I should say it looks different in every classroom. So it's not just like one, one approach. It's saying to people, well, what, what game are you playing here? Right. What are the rules in this game? And, uh, and letting every instructor to define that for themselves. So we see all kinds of variants on this, uh, in different classrooms across campus and in campuses around the country and around the world that are using Gradecraft. And most of these faculty presumably end up converting things back to an A, B, C, D system because somewhere in Michigan's registrar offices that's required. Um, but the thing that you've done is to say, well, instead of saying you all start with 100 and we're just going to see how far you fall each time you step up to the assessment plate, you're going to say you're all going to start at zero and there's going to be sort of lots of different ways to build points, to demonstrate mastery, to accrete your proficiency. Um, and so through a number of different pathways, um, you know, as many of you as possible should meet as many of the learning goals as possible um, as can be, be achieved. Um, use and, and we'll put in the show notes uh, links to Gradecraft and, and some of the other things that you've shared there. Wonderful. So schools are going to start looking more normal in September, hopefully. Um, we'll have lots of folks get vaccinated. Lots more people go back on campus. Um, people are going to be really tired. At least that's one of our sort of key findings right now. Like it's probably not a moment. Um, in which educational systems are going to profoundly reinvent them um, because the people who've been leading those educational institutions are going to go take a nap this summer. Um, but as they wake up from their nap and come back in September, um, what kinds of conversations are you hoping that they have? Where might what you get fit into that? Um, what, what should we be talking about next to, to keep thinking about assessment and grading? Yeah, I, I'm certainly planning on starting a reading and discussion group among my colleagues. Uh, to start to open them up to this idea you know, what's possible. And the first step there is to really problematize grading, right? To get them to question what feels natural and to think about what else we could do. Um, I, I mentioned the term infrastructure earlier. I think cre creating tools that help shape practice is really important. So I actually, I subscribe to, a, a, this is actually ironic given the current political debate about what do we mean by infrastructure? Um, it's not, it's I, uh, not I align... just childcare. It's it's also like grading tools should be in the infrastructure bill. Yeah, uh, but it's because you know this sort of sociological definition of infrastructure uh, is that it really is sort of the standards and conventions that shape practice. So that you know we we build roads and bridges that match the way we think we want to drive, um, and the way we build those roads and bridges, in fact, reinforces the way we do drive. Um, and so infrastructure has a lot to do with more than just the roads and bridges. You know, it, it is, it is things like childcare and it is things like learning management systems, right? A learning management system is a kind of infrastructure that really shapes grading practices because the grade books in these things are built by actually a, one brief side, short side rant is most learning management systems aren't built by people who think about learning. They're built by computer scientists and business majors 
literally, who were um, who, who are recreating their experience in some respect. This only further reinforces all these elements of the system we've been talking about, including the grade books. It, you know, you can use a tool. I'll just call it like a canvas. There are mastery pathways in Canvas. There are various ways that Canvas tips their hat to these alternative ways of thinking about grading. But when you talk to people that are trying to use them, they all sort of throw their hands up and say, yeah, that didn't really work out because Canvas really, really wants 100% somewhere in there. Uh, and it's just a bear to work around that problem. Um, so that's why we built Gradecraft, right? It's You could plug it into Canvas and use it as sort of a grade book that is built around alternative notions of learning and grading that welcomes you to experiment and welcome and doesn't enforce a particular model on you. And that's a kind of infrastructure. So we also need to build that out more broadly. So one of the reasons why K-12 schools are so reluctant, and this comes up in what you get all through the book, as the students are saying, well, how will I get into college? And how exactly did college get to demand so much of what high school was all about? Um, and really, I, I view college as the tail that wags the dog here because so much of K-12, even for, even for learners who maybe don't feel like they're college bound is designed around college uh, and the college admissions process in particular. And this is one of my, another sort of observation of mine as a recent old man is, um, you know, when I was in high school, arguably high school was preparation for college. Today, high school is arguably preparation to apply to college. It's, it's all about getting your resume in order and because so much of that process is impossible to control, students tend to get overly focused and, par and their parents and, and everyone else gets overly focused on the things they think they can control, which are their grades and their test scores. Um, everything else is an intangible. So um, we need to change the college admissions process. We need to, we need to, we need to retrain the dog, right? Um, or retrain the tail. Wag in some other direction. Yeah. So uh, in the intro, I, I mentioned the movements like the Mastery Transcript Consortium, which are building tools that are, in fact, infrastructure. They're trying to replace the standard transcript with something that is aligned with mastery-based learning. And once you have those tools, I think it makes it easier for teachers uh, and parents and learners to see um, what's possible. And the Mastery Transcript Consortium has had some success. They had... Uh, I, I don't know the exact, exact numbers offhand, but they had, you know, uh, something like 100 students using the mastery transcript to apply to colleges last year, and they were successful. They got into colleges, including the University of Michigan. And so with these example success stories, we can start to kind of calm some of the fears of these hyperactive parents um, and start to say, look, this is another pathway that maybe is better for everybody. Um, and if the colleges start to demand it, then, you know, we'll start to see. I, I One thing that I am hoping is that even when we go back to normal, that things like test optional or even test not looked at here become th that they stay in college admissions. I certainly think it's going to be looked at very, very closely. Yeah. You know, there are one of the things and there's a whole bunch of pieces in education that we thought that we could never possibly do without without SATs and test scores, you know, the college board getting entirely rid of the SAT two tests. Um, and we got rid of them for a couple of years yeah. and it all seems to still be running. And so maybe we could keep doing without them. And then I had this really optimistic conversation um, with, a, with a group of high school educators in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and they said, you know, the one thing we can do after this year is change. Um, we, we've changed every two, every three weeks. Um, we have not stretched our change muscles quite as much before, but boy, we can change it. We're tired. And so there's not going to be all the change maybe that people want um, by September. But I think there are a lot of institutions um, that for, you know, for all the, the terrible terrors of the, of the pandemic and COVID-19 um, have, have found themselves stretching in new ways. Well, Barry Fishman, um, I've been learning with you since I was a student in one of your classes nearly 15 years ago, and I'm privileged to continue to be able to learn to, from you. Um, so thanks for joining us here on Teach Lab. A real pleasure, Justin. Um, I want to say full circle that course, I'm still teaching it. Uh, and this fall, Failure to Disrupt will be the key text for that course. Terrific. Uh, the mix of the book and the podcast conversations uh, from the book club, I think, are going to be a great way for my students to really dig into what's challenging about education technology and 
the, the limit the limitations it has for really leading to true change. That's great. And you'll get your twenty dollars by PayPal. And I'm not long <laughs> after. All right. Thanks everybody. I'm Justin Reich. Thanks for listening to Teach Lab. You can check out our show notes for links to the new edition of What'd You Get and other resources like Gradecraft that we discussed today. Be sure to subscribe to Teach Lab for future episodes and consider leaving us a review. You can find my Barry Fishman recommended and assigned book, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education at booksellers everywhere. And you can check out related content at failuretodisrupt.com. That's failuretodisrupt.com. The Teaching Systems Lab has two courses that you can sign up for for free on edX. You can join myself and Vanderbilt professor Rich Milner in a free self-paced online course for educators called Becoming a More Equitable Educator, Mindsets and Practices. Or you can join myself and Sam Weinberg and his team at the Stanford History Education Group in Sorting Truth from Fiction, Civic Online Reasoning, where you'll learn the skills and practices of information literacy that folks like fact checkers use to sort fact from fiction online. If you've previously taken either of these courses, we'd love to have you back, bring your colleagues, form a learning circle in your school or community, and just come and participate in our online community. You can find the links to these courses on edX in our show notes, and you can enroll now. This episode of Teach Lab was produced by Amy Corrigan and Garrett Beasley, recorded and sound mixed by Garrett Beasley. Stay safe until next time.